preaching, we can probably go home. Of course, we won't do that. Uh, it's always refreshing to come into the Lord's house because it gives us perspective in life. When things of this world come against us and we don't understand the evil in this world, it gives us understanding. You know, that's what, that's what David said. David said in Psalm 74, uh, starting in uh, Psalm 73, rather, starting in verse 16, uh, speaking of, of all the evil that he saw, he said in verse 16, When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. He's talking about the evil men that were opposing him. When we come into the sanctuary of God, then we understand the end. Then we gain perspective on what our situation really is and the hope that we have in Christ. Through his death, burial, and resurrection. And this morning, I want to preach to you from 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 5, just one verse. If you'd be pleased to turn there with me. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. And there, the Apostle Paul writes this. He says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Let me take a moment to pray over my efforts. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to stand in your pulpit. And it is your pulpit, Lord. Lord, there's nothing that I can do without you. Lord, I need your anointing. I need your strength. I need your guidance. I've done the best I can to study and prepare and be led by you, Lord. But you must come and preach now. And please help me and strengthen me in my endeavors. Help it to be a blessing to someone. Help it to speak to hearts today, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now here in this passage that we've just read, we are immediately presented with three parties, or three actors, we could say, within that passage, within that sentence. We have God, and we have Jesus, and we have men. That's us. And we have to ask ourselves the nature of the relationship that, between these three persons. Who are they? What's their function? Uh, what function do they serve between themselves? What roles do they play? And at once we see that Jesus is shown to be our mediator. And not just our mediator, but God's mediator to us. But then, of course, I have to ask, well, what is a mediator? And perhaps you've heard of, or no doubt you've heard of a median in a road. A median is a line in a road or a raised platform. And in some sense, it can be said that that median arbitrates. It intervenes between two lanes of opposing traffic so that they don't collide with one another. So just as a median then must be in the middle uh, to separate traffic, so to be a mediator means also to be in the middle. And as a median is between these two lanes of opposing traffic that we just mentioned, the mediator is between two opposing persons or parties, two people who are at variance with one another, who are opposed to one another. So a mediator stands in the middle, as a middleman, between two parties, two people who are out of fellowship one with the other. And that mediator can't just be any man. He has to be counted as trustworthy. He has to be counted as faithful by both parties involved. So we see that humanity, then, is not in a favorable position with God. He's not even in a neutral position with God. He's opposed to him. And some man, some mediator, Jesus Christ, 
must be brought in to sort out our differences. And this mediator that Paul speaks of operates for us in a legal sense. Today we would call such a man a lawyer. Jesus then is our lawyer. But if he is our lawyer, who then is our judge? Well, of course, it's God. Psalm 75, 5 says, God is judge. He putteth down one, and setteth up another. But if God is judge, and Jesus is our mediator, then it follows that mankind is a defendant in a court case. And it's the highest court, much higher than the Tennessee Supreme Court, the Virginia Supreme Court, or even the United States Supreme Court. It's a cosmic court. It's a heavenly court in which the Lord God of heaven sits in judgment of mankind's sin. And court cases are titled, aren't they? Uh, it's the court versus the defendant. That's how the title is arranged. Perhaps you would have the court of Green County versus John Doe, or the court of Sullivan County versus Jane Doe. Well, this is the court of the Lord versus mankind, versus men and women and boys and girls. And the judge, the God of heaven and earth, asks us all, how do we plead in the charge laid against us? So I want to ask us today, three principal questions. First, what is the charge? Second, how does Jesus mediate that charge for us? And third, what is the final verdict in this case of the Lord versus mankind? Well, first, let's consider the charge in this case. We've been charged with transgression of God's law. First John Chapter 3, verse 4, the Apostle John writes, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. But a hypothetical defendant might complain, I've not sinned, I do good. Well, the question isn't whether someone has done good in this world and life. The question is whether someone has ever done bad whether or not you sinned against God. Paul says to that in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This leaves out none, not one. That's why Jesus says, that that's, that's why Jesus must be the mediator of all men, not just some men, but all men. Indeed, later on in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, in the verses latter half, half, Paul writes, We trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. That's to say salvation, or mediation, as our passage has it, is open to all men and effective to those that believe in Jesus, who trust in His mediation between God and men. But another person might protest, I didn't have uh, any knowledge of sin, so how was I to keep from it? But again, Paul tells us that by the law is the knowledge of sin. And then our hypothetical defendant might go on to argue this. He might say, but I've never had a Bible. I don't know God's law to know His will in my life. Yet Romans 2, 15 through 16 says, when the Gentiles, that's us, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness. In other words, God's law, penned in the Bible, was also written upon our hearts. And our conscience testifies to that. When we do evil, and we feel guilty for it, that demonstrates that we have an awareness, a sense that we have sinned against our holy God and His law. All people are guilty of the charge of sin. 
We are utterly beset by sin. We are utterly surrounded by it. We can't escape it. We can't even begin to entertain the idea that sin has not affected our souls. That we have somehow avoided its stain. You see, King David said, Psalm 51, verses 4 and 5, Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. See, David here is acknowledging he, his guilt to God. He's up front about it with God. And his evidence of his guilt is to say, look, I was born with a nature that's inclined to evil. Of course I'm guilty. And you're just in your judgment of my sin. And what you speak against me, God. We are shaken in iniquity. We come from our mother's womb, sin shaped. Romans chapter 3, 10 through 12 says, There is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. You see, we've inherited this fatal disease from our forefather Adam. It's called sin. It's called death. That's physical death one day in the future for us. It's spiritual death now. And it's the second death in the lake of fire for those that reject Jesus' mediation. The wages of sin is death, Scripture tells me. Romans 5.12 says, By one man, that's Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Then I can skip down to verse 14, and it says, Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. What does all that mean? That means because Adam sinned, we sin. All of creation has been infected with sin and its effects. Elsewhere, the Bible says in so many words that creation groans for our redemption because by Adam's actions, the whole universe has been plunged into ruin. And by our future redemption, the whole universe will also be redeemed. Why is that? It's because Adam was the figure of the one to come. This means that Adam was in some way like Jesus. We can ask, well, what way was that? What well, was in the way of representation? He bore God's image of authority and dominion on this earth. That was his role. Genesis 2, 26, God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Likewise, Psalm 8, verses 4 through 8, David writes in a dual application of Adam and Jesus. He says this, he says, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, and the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the seas. As I said before, Adam was our representative. Creation was his charge, his responsibility, this world and all things in it, and by extension, all peoples to come through his loins. That's us. That was his responsibility. We were his responsibility. And he failed us when he sinned. And the world has suffered for it ever since. That's why Adam is the figure of him to come. That's why scripture tells us Jesus is the last Adam. That's why 
scripture says, in Adam all die. Even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Where Adam failed to represent humanity and plunged us into sin guilt, Jesus represents those who believe on him that justify the ungodly. Our charge against us is sin. Our charge is transgression of God's law. Christ is the mediator of men because men need a mediator to stand between them and the Lord, their judge. But how does Jesus mediate for us in this charge of sin? That's our second question that I have for us today. How does he clear those guilty of death? Well, he represents us in our sin guilt. He takes sin's punishment for us. Our guilt has been laid upon his shoulders. Perhaps you've heard of the concept of the whipping boy. A whipping boy was a child in the 16th and 17th centuries in England and in Europe. And he took the punishment due to a boy prince. And the whipping boy had done nothing wrong but atone for the sins of the guilty prince. By whipping that other child, it was considered that justice had been accomplished and the prince was absolved of his crime. Well, in the same way, Scripture informs me that though Jesus knew no sin, he became sin for us. And thereby he reconciled us to God. Jesus took our whipping. He represented us in our transgression. Isaiah 53, 5 through 6. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He took that punishment for us. You'll recall earlier I quoted Psalm 8, verse 5, and I noted there that it had a dual application, both to Adam and to Jesus. So again, David writes, For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. And then Paul takes up that same verse in Hebrews 2 and 9, and he says, But we see Jesus, he was made a little lower than the angels. For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Christ is our mediator. Because when God demanded our death, Jesus stepped between God and men and offered himself on the cross. Hebrews 9 and 15 Says, and for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal, eternal inheritance. How is Jesus our mediator? He is our mediator by his death. The charge was transgression of God's law. Jesus was our mediator. And when the death sentence was handed down, Jesus took it upon himself that we could live. I read a great story that illustrates all we've been talking about so far this morning. It was a story about the preacher, D.L. Moody, and his experience with the boy. Preacher Moody had been visiting a deacon's house during a revival meeting, and he left that deacon's house uh, it was put up in another man's house for the night. And to Preacher Moody's chagrin, he realized that he had left his umbrella and his satchel at that deacon's house. So Mr. Moody asked his host son to walk over to the deacon's house down the road and retrieve his belongings. And the boy did this. But on his way back, being a boy as a kind of game to pass the time, he began to balance the satchel on the umbrella over his shoulder. Well, he became so preoccupied in this balancing act that he stopped paying attention to the road. And he came upon a rise in the road and stumbled and fell and 
broke the umbrella. And he was overcome with guilt. And he sought for a solution, but he was at a loss. He didn't know what to do. But then it occurred to him that if he told his father, that, that would soften the blow between him and Mr. Moody. And he wouldn't have to tell the preacher. His father would do it for him and perhaps make some kind of restitution between the two. And then he wouldn't be in trouble with that preacher anymore. And this was precisely what the boy did. But things didn't go as he had planned because soon after his father told the preacher, Mr. Moody summoned the boy before him and he said, So you broke my umbrella, son. And before the boy could answer, Moody continued, Then you became frightened. It was a shame, didn't you? Then you thought, If I tell my father, he can go between me and the preacher and get everything squared away. And then I can come before the preacher without any embarrassment. And the boy nodded that this was indeed the case. Then Moody replied, Now, my lad, that's the way it is with all of us. We are sinners, afraid of God, but God has provided a mediator, someone to go between us and him, and that mediator is Jesus. He died for us and is the way to God. Again, our text tells us there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Well, we've considered here the charge that is against us, and we've looked at how Jesus mediates it for us. And now I ask finally, what is to be the verdict in this case between the Lord versus mankind? Well, without the mediating blood of Jesus, it's dead. But the verdict can be changed if we're willing. It's often quoted in Revelation 22, verse 17 says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that hear us say, Come. And let him that is the thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. It's free. By grace through faith and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. You can't mediate for yourself. It's the gift of Jesus to men, women, boys, and girls. But Jesus only mediates for those who desire it. In our human law system, you have the right to refuse an attorney. You have the right to self-representation before the judge. And God grants us this same right. All those who reject the gospel have chosen to represent themselves before God as righteous. And if they die in that state of self-justification and rejection of God's mercy, the judgment that came to Belshazzar in the book of Daniel will come to them if you recall, God told that wicked king there, Thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. The soul who dies without Christ's intercession will find that the balance of his righteousness has been weighed in the scales against his iniquity and found wanting. It won't measure up against God's holy standard. The Gospel of John Jesus declares, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's so many ways, so many religions in this world. And all but one are false. Before church this morning, I did a quick Google search that revealed by their estimate there are 4,000 distinct religions in this world. Not counting any subgroups or denominations. Imagine that, 4,000 roads that promised heaven and 3,999 of them that lead straight to hell. And it's for the sole reason those 3,999 don't have Jesus as the mediator between God and men. They trust to some false god that they've worked by their own hands or some man or woman as sinful as themselves or some system of works some invented creed in which they've entrusted their souls. 
But Proverbs 14, 12 tells me, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. All these, all these systems, all these religions, they're all ways of death because every last one of them at their bottom says the sinner must pay for his or her sins to have life or inner peace or nirvana or whatever those false religions want to label it. And within that terrible, dreadful theology that they've invented is this notion that you really are righteous enough in yourself. But the Bible says that we're dead in our trespasses and sins. What works can a dead man offer to make himself alive again? He can only trust in Jesus who raises the dead. That's what Scripture says. Scripture says the just shall live by faith. I read an excellent sermon the other evening by a man named Adney from the beginning of the last century. And this man said, if any are driven to seek peace in the intellectual nirvana of agnosticism, that's just to say, in not knowing whether there's a God or not, it's not for want of a gospel, it's rather from the bewilderment of the claims of too many gospels. But how otherwise are we to escape from this confusion of cries, this babble of utterance, and all the perplexity it engenders, and the despair of ever reaching truth to which it points. I answer, Abney says, we must turn a deaf ear to the whole of them and seek truth in Jesus. We have too many gospels today, too many ways that promise mediation, and Scripture tells us there is but one mediator between God and men. We are to stand before God. We will do it only by Christ's intercession. In Adam all die. In Christ all live. Galatians 3, 20 through 22. It says now a mediator is not a mediator of one. But God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life verily, righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture has concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith that Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Our text tells us again, there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. He mediates for us by representing us the way that Adam couldn't, the way that we can't because of our sin. By being sinless, our mediator is able to present us faultless and reconciled to God. And in the end, those who have refused Jesus will only have their filthy rags of righteousness as a defense. And then where will their good works be? Then where will all their false ways be? They'll be burned up in God's wrath. There'll be nothing they'll have to stand before God with. We come to the Father by the Son. We come to our mediator, the man Christ Jesus. That requires Calvary. That requires His atoning blood. It was our blood that should have been shed that day. Our backs that should have been lashed. It was our side that should have been pierced. The stripes given to Him belonged to me. And they belong to you in the latter part of Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. Paul says, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ faithfully represented us as our intercessor, as our mediator between God and men. He gave himself in love in order that we might live in order that we might escape the punishment that was due to all of us. I pray today that I've been some help to you, some blessing.